Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. This program is dedicated to bringing you relevant insight into the biblical text that pertains to our time. Here is Dr. Woodhead with today's Bible teaching. The section of scripture that we're going in today in this book of Zechariah is a question of fasting. And uh, it's actually much deeper than that. It's a question in the church of legalism and uh, adhering to practices that are unbiblical and forcing them on the members of the uh, congregation or the group. So I'm going to read the first seven verses in that chapter. Well, the text reads, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of Jehovah came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Chislev. Now they of Bethel had sent Sherezer and Regimelech and their men to entreat the favor of Jehovah and to speak unto the priest of the house of Jehovah of hosts and to the prophets, saying, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself if I, as I've done these so many years? Then came the word of Jehovah of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and in the seventh month, even these seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? And when ye eat and when ye drink, do not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves, should ye not hear the words which Jehovah cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity and the cities thereof round about her and the south and the lowlands were inhabited? Now let's look at the timing of this prophecy because the first verse there says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of Jehovah came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Kislev. Now, in the beginning of this book, we were given dates that were 516 B.C. That was when the first message came to Zechariah. And this is two years later. This is 518 B.C. And uh, <clears throat> these divine oracles are given. It says at the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Kislev. And this is December of 518 B.C. So it's two years after those first prophecies. It's along the lines of those first prophecies, but it's much more specific about the sins that they were committing and have been committing. Remember, those first eight visions that came had five prophecies that were so encouraging to the Jews. I'm going to restore you. I love you. You're going to have a city. You're going to have a nation. Um, you're going to have a king sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, reigning and talking about the millennial reign. This is a, um, a vision that is in keeping with that, but more tuned to those last three of the eight prophecies where he talked about not tolerating sin, not tolerating them distancing themselves from him, and being true and faithful to what he has said. The people who were taken away from Jerusalem were mostly professionals, mostly the higher economic status people that Nebuchadnezzar came in finally in 586 and took them away. Now, he wanted to build his own nation with these smart, wealthy, affluent, motivated people. So he took all the best, all the best. He left the poor and the indigent there. Because he figured, well, they're not going to do anything. They can't help me. So he left them there. And that's what Jerusalem was populated with for 70 plus years. Now, these people that were coming back, which was almost 50,000 of them, were paying attention to what Zechariah was saying. They were paying attention to what Haggai was saying. But, you know, most of the people that were carted away if you think about this, they were there for 70 years, some of them 79 years, because the first um, wave of Nebuchadnezzar coming in was 605 B.C. So, my goodness, you know, there, there's these people, uh, 79, 80 years in some cases, that had been there. 
they had families, they had places to stay, they had jobs now. And now they had a group, the Medes, who had taken over from the Babylonians, and the Medes were friendly towards the Jews. So these guys weren't under any massive pressure to go back. Most of them stayed. Most of them stayed. They just didn't see any reason to go back. They tolerated what was going on, and the Medes were pretty friendly to them. The temple in Jerusalem was nearing completion. These folks even started building <coughs> new residences that were pretty fine, according to Haggai 1.4. Jerusalem seemed like it was on its way back. I mean, things were starting to get prosperous. And when they came back, it was a group of people, this 50,000 that came back, they knew what God had done. They knew it. They knew that they were responsible for causing the problems. Now, while they were in captivity, though, they had begun to observe some unbiblical concepts. One of those is fasting. One of those is fasting. They began to observe these fasts in commemoration of destructions, bad calamities that had fallen them, of the temple, the loss of the land. And um, these issues were now being raised by a group of people that came from Bethel. And they, Zechariah was telling them what God had said to them. These people wanted to know if they should continue with these fasts that they had been um, commemorating these bad events with back in Babylon. Now, Jehovah God, through Zechariah, is not going to directly answer them. It's kind of interesting the way this works. He's going to answer them a few chapters later directly, but for now, he wants them to understand the environment. So he's going to talk about what it is that's taking place here and let them think about it. The second verse says, Now they of Bethel had sent Sharezer and Regimelech and their men to entreat the favor of Jehovah. The people of Bethel sent these two guys, and Bethel was about 12 miles north of Jerusalem, to make an inquiry of the Lord in his temple, Jerusalem. They were going to talk to the priest, and they were going to talk to the prophets. Now, some Bible translations, like my King James, mistranslates Bethel to be the house of God. Well, the name Bethel means house of God, but we're not talking about the temple. We're talking about the city of Bethel. Because there's no other Old Testament reference to corroborate that. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense that they came from the temple to go to the temple. Uh, but <laughs> I don't know why some people translate things strangely. Um, these guys really had an earnest desire to go before the Lord through the priests and through the prophets in the temple and say, should we keep doing this stuff? Should we keep doing this stuff? These guys were Jewish, even though they had these pagan Babylonian names. Hey, the Babylonians did that. Look what they did with Daniel and his three friends. They converted their names right away. And... Uh, Bethel also had been a center of massive pagan worship when the northern ten tribes split from the southern tribes after Solomon's death. It was 931 B.C. Jeroboam I, who was a terrible guy and their first king in the north, he committed so many heinous acts. Uh, he made golden calves and he set up a worship center at Bethel. And they just engaged in all kinds of things, child sacrifice and uh, worshiping the occult and oh, all kinds of weird stuff. And uh, this city did not have a good history. It did not have a good history. The men, though, that led this delegation were wholesome, honest guys, and Bethel was no longer a center of pagan worship. They had gotten taken away by the Assyrians a couple hundred years before. 
And that pagan center had died out over this time. And these guys that were there, they actually came from Babylon. So they were in Babylon those 70 years. They knew that they shouldn't be doing these things, but they wanted to really know, should we be having these fasting practices? They said, and to speak unto the priests of the house of Jehovah of hosts and to the prophets, saying, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself if I've done these many years? Now, they, they, they acknowledge that Jerusalem was the true ecclesiastical capital. This is where all religious activities were going to take place, and they knew that it wasn't going to be in Bethel anymore. But they're wanting to know, should they weep in the fifth month, separating themselves? Well, they're referring to that old concept of the Nazarite vows, the separating individual, Hinazer. Now, a Nazarite would separate himself from everybody, no strong drink, no body indulgences, they only ate certain foods, and very, very few people were chosen for that. Very, very few people. But these people in Babylon had started doing these things, thinking it was the right thing to do. You know, the prophets in the Bible are very, very precise people about the Word of God. They will bring God's Word down to the people like a thunder. The priest, on the other hand, would bring people to God and coddle them and work with them to try and get them to understand. That's not what the prophet did. The prophet would see sin and just throw God's word down. But they were careful about what they did. They didn't do it without a lot of um, realization of whether they were doing the right thing or not. They had to carry out this responsibility properly But what was going on? These guys were practicing self-developed rituals. They were not practicing godly concepts. You know, it's important to realize that the Bible does not teach that fasting is a commandment. Christ even talked about fasting, but he implied that people were doing it. He never said I'm commanding you to fast. He just thought people were doing it because people did it. These fasts that were going on in Babylon were self-indulgent. And it's sort of like, you know, I'm going to try and appease God, but I'm going to do it my way. I don't care what he says. (laughs) I want to do what I want to do, and I'm going to do it this way. There is a a passage in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 where the Apostle Paul talks about repentance. He talks about the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow for an event like this captivity where they were persecuted severely, they're sorry that it happened to them. But they're not sorry for what they did to cause it. You know, it's like, Today you would say, well, gee, I'm really sorry I got caught. I'm not sorry for what I did. <laughs> Even though they don't say that, you know, oh, I'm so sorry. You see the politicians doing that. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Well, you're sorry you got caught. You're not really sorry you did what led to this. And this fast that they were carrying out was done in the fifth month of the Jewish year of Ab, which is about August in the Gregorian calendar. It's our calendar. And it's still observed by the Jews. I mean, the the month of Ab is observed from this time because of all the calamities that have happened to them. And they keep this thing going. Two of those, or three of them actually, it's actually three, of these calamities were prior to Zechariah's time. So they um, they were lamenting the fact that uh, they were kept out of Canaan in the first time they were to go in there because when the spies came back and said, man, there's giants in the land. So God kept them from going in there right away. They're lamenting that fact. Remember, 
back back to this. It was only two, two guys, only two of them, or uh, Joshua, excuse me, only two of them that came back out of the 12 that said, eh, they're not so bad. We can go in there. We can take Canaan. Ten of them going, oh, no, man, I'm scared, I'm scared. And they weren't thinking about the Lord being with them and doing the leading and taking charge. That was the first one. The second one was the destruction of the temple. They were mourning the destruction of the temple, and they would have a fast for that in the month of Ab. And then there was a guy who was set up as the governor of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, and he got murdered about 10 years later. And they actually liked this guy, but he got murdered 10 years later, so they were mourning his murder. Over time, over time, these fasts and these memorials increased. And there's an enormous list of them now that, they, that the Orthodox in Israel will practice. The second temple, which was re-inaugurated on 516 B.C., was destroyed by the Romans, Titus Vespasian, in 70 A.D. They mourn that. There was a Bar Kokhba rebellion between 132 A.D. and 135 A.D., where... A group of people thought this guy was the Messiah, and they had completely missed Jesus, refused to even acknowledge Jesus, and they kept trying to find a Messiah. And there's been a lot of false messiahs since Christ. This was one of them, Simon Bar Kokhba. So Simon's followers uh, tried to throw the Romans out. It didn't work. Hadrian came in and leveled the city, leveled it. And uh, some guy named Turnus Rufus, a year or two later, plowed the entire temple under, so there was nothing left of it. <laughs> I mean, he really did it. They mourned that. They mourned the first crusade in 1096 A.D., where uh, 1.2 million Jews were slaughtered. You know, the crusaders, on the way to free Jerusalem from the Muslims, killed everybody in sight. And almost all Jews. It's crazy to read about the Crusades, but that's what happened. Uh, they mourn them being expelled from England in 1290, expelled from France in 1306, expelled from Spain and the Inquisition in 1492. You know, it's interesting. They were expelled from Spain in 1492, and that was the same year that Columbus came here. The same year that Columbus came here. And this country here has given them more freedom, more latitude, more love than any other nation on this earth. At least up until now. They say that World War I happened, started in the month of Ab, which led to the Nazi Holocaust, and that was in 1914. Heinrich Himmler, the Reichsfuhrer of Nazi Germany, implemented the final solution, which is the use of that gas, in 1941. And then the Ger German began a mass board deportation of the Jews to the death camps in 1942. They set up trains and buses and all kinds. I mean, they had a rail system that was just filled with Jewish people just taking them to the death camps. And that was done on, uh, in the month of Ab. So they, they've, they've got contemporary, oh, and they've added more. I just put a few of them down here. What needs to be said is that the Bible never has any commandment for perpetual mourning. <laughs> that doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. They're nowhere commanded. There's only one implied continual fast, and even that requires a lot of stretching. Because uh, the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, that we see in the book of Leviticus, they're told to afflict their souls meaning be sorrowful for your sins, confess your sins. It doesn't say go into this fast and have this specific ritual. It doesn't describe that. But people will do things that are outside the Scripture, thinking that that's what needs to be done. Instead of learning what the Bible says and doing what God says, people want to do what they want to do. <laughs> There are no continual fasts in the Bible. There are a few instances where a fast is commanded, like in the first chapter of Joel, but no continual fast. 
And that's what they were doing in Babylon. And so here they're coming to the temple to talk to these priests and talk to these prophets and say, hey, should we keep going with this? You know, the short answer is, read your Bible. <laughs> read the Bible. God condemns people for doing these things, even if he has commanded them, if this is what they're doing to replace their obedience to God. If people are carrying out specific practices and thinking that that is enough, just attending church, going through some prayer, saying, okay, I said these three prayers, I'm all fixed, right? Uh, eating something, not eating something. I mean, the list is endless. The list is endless. God wants our hearts and our obedience. He didn't care about these practices. Look what he says. I'm going to read Isaiah 1, verses 1 to 10. Here, the rule, with the word of Jehovah. Now, this is what he's calling the Jews now. Ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. I mean, these are not nice things to say to somebody. What unto me is the multitude of your sacrifices, saith Jehovah? I had enough of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. New moon and Sabbath, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with iniquity and the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me, and I am weary of bearing them. And when ye spread forth your hand, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. <laughs> I mean, he's pretty clear here. He's saying, you, don't get, you guys are doing all these things. And even he's commanded these things in the Mosaic Law. But they were going through the motions. Their hearts were not wedded to God. They didn't want God. They thought they were just, okay, we'll just do these things and we're done. You know, I was working once and um, at a, uh, I was working on a, a corporate merger once and this lady says to me, um, how, how long do you have to stay in church on Sunday? I said, do I have to stay? What do you mean? I said, I, I, I you know, I wasn't sure what she was asking me. She said, well, I only have to stay for 40 minutes. Oh, okay, well, that's cool. I don't have to stay at all. <laughs> that's the attitude, though, you know? That's the attitude. And there are a ton of practices like this in the church, in the church today. We call it legalism, which is the imposition by the leaders of unbiblical practices that they, they especially, they tie it to your salvation. Or your growth in Christ, your sanctification. You know, it goes something like this. Well, obviously, if you know, you dance or if you smoke cigarettes or, oh, my goodness, if you drink alcohol, you're obviously not going to heaven. You're obviously not saved. And they look down on you or they impose even worse ones. For example, I put a few examples down there for you. Keeping the Sabbath. Most people have no idea what the Sabbath even is. If they read all the passages of the Sabbath in the Bible, they would know that they can't keep the Sabbath. It's impossible. And if you don't keep the Sabbath as strongly as you can with as much vigor, you get killed. It results in death. But they don't want to read what the Bible teaches. See, they want to pick and choose and make their own laws. Why well, keep the Sabbath? Really? How do you do that? Well, you know, I mean, we just, I said, well, what about these passages? Well, we don't do those passages. So you've made up your own Sabbath. Oh, that's interesting. Infrequent communion. There are some churches that will do communion like once every six weeks, eight weeks. I, you know, when the Bible says, do it whenever you meet. There's another concept called penance. Penance, which is what these guys in Israel were doing. They were trying to appease God by doing these fasts. You can't appease God by doing something. You can appease him by obeying him. 
not by going through some act. It's not going to work. Requiring a Sunday meeting. There is no text in the New Testament that says we have to meet on Sunday. It's customary, and there's nothing wrong with meeting on Sunday. And the only reason we do this is because people have come to accept what the apostles did at the beginning. They said, hey, we're going to meet on Sunday. There's no commandment, though. We can meet any day of the week we want. It doesn't matter, but people have, oh, no, we have to meet on Sunday. Well, where does it say that? Well, it must say it somewhere. You know what I mean? They just don't read the Bible. The concept of transubstantiation. Many denominations will treat communion as if it's the actual body and blood of Christ. Boy, it looks like juice and bread to me. I don't know. Uh, I don't know where they get that stuff. The concept of purgatory, that there's some place you go when you leave here that's a temporary confinement. However, I pay a little money and, you know, you can get out a little early. It's another interesting concept, not in the Bible. Expanding the Bible to include non-canonical writings. In other words, we've got our own little book in addition to the Bible. And this is important. But there's no authorization from God. Where did you get that? Well, you know, it's special. Okay. Or reducing the Bible. This is what you see even more often. Well, we don't look at those books or we don't touch that stuff. We only look at these books here. Well, why don't you teach the whole thing? These are all heretical things to do. You teach the whole counsel of God. That way there's no error. If Israel and the church would pay attention to what the scriptures are, they'd be in much better shape in their relationship to God than they are now. You know, this delegation from Bethel that was going to the temple, they were really eager to know, should we keep these things going? Should we keep these things going? And it's interesting to see the way God responds to this, and we're going to see this in this chapter and the next one. God responds to things by answering a question that's not asked. <laughs> In other words, you see Christ do the very same thing throughout the book of John. And the biggest example that I've got there is when Nicodemus comes to him and says, Lord, Lord, I, Rabbi, man, we know you must be from God because uh, you're doing all these miracles. And Christ said, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. What? I want to talk to you about miracles and, you know, what's going on here and everything we're seeing. You've got to be born again. Nicodemus, what are you talking about? Jesus answers a question that's not asked because he gets right to the heart of every matter. And that's what God's doing here. God's saying, you guys don't get it. I want you to love me. I want you to obey me. I don't care about these practices. You, you, you know, you're, you're asking the wrong questions. You ought to be asking, how can we learn more of your ways and obey you? That's what needs to be done. Nicodemus needed to be saved. He did not have salvation. And what God is saying through Christ is, you need to be born again. Without being born again, you are not part of the church. And you hear today that born again concept is used as an adjective to being a Christian. Well, he's a born again Christian. But there are also... And then they modify the term Christian. No, there are, the church is only consisted of those who have received the salvation of God and are what Christ has born again, regenerated on the way to heaven. There isn't any other church. That's the whole church. Now, what God is going to do here in these next couple of verses is he's going to expose how selfish and legalistic these guys were. Then came the word of Jehovah of hosts unto me. That's Zechariah talking now in the first person, saying, Speak unto all the peoples of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and in the seventh month, even these seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me, even unto me, when ye did eat and when ye did drink? Do not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? 
Now, this kind of parallels those seven, or excuse me, those eight visions, but it's more tuned into the last three because this is revealing what God is saying to them and what he really wants. You know, in the first five of those eight visions we looked at, he was just telling them, man, them things are coming back. I'm going to crown the priesthood. You're going to rebuild the temple. The city's coming back. Everything's going to be great. And then the last three, he says, you've got to make an end to sin. I am not going to tolerate that anymore. It's almost like he builds them up for these eight, uh, excuse me, first five, and then he says, but here's the issue. You've got to stop sinning. You've got to stop sinning. So the um, scripture back in the first chapter calls these Devarim Tobihim, Devarim Nechumim, in good words, comforting words, which he gives them. There's consolatory or conciliatory announcements that Jehovah is zealous for Zion. And he's going to return to Jerusalem with mercies. And not only are the people going to be restored, but he is going to come to Jerusalem and live there. That's not going to happen until the millennium. You know, the Shekinah glory never entered the second temple until Christ was baptized there. He, until he was on the, on the eighth day of his life, his parents brought him to the temple for that circumcision. Excuse me, it wasn't a baptism, it was a circumcision. That's when the Shekinah glory entered that temple. God did not set up residence in that temple on a permanent basis like he did in Solomon's temple. He came and lived in Solomon's temple. And the Bible shows us in great detail about that Shekinah glory coming and his presence there. He didn't come to the second temple. They're talking about when he's coming to Jerusalem to live, to the temple. It's when he returns in the millennial kingdom. When he returns and he runs the government of the world. It's like Isaiah says, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. He's got this everlasting love for the nation Israel, but he won't permit sin. And it's, it's an interesting relationship that he has because we have the same sort of relationship with our children. We love our children unconditionally, but we're not going to let them get away with things that are inappropriate. And that's what God's doing. It's a much grander scale, a much more strict punishment but it's the same exact thing. These visions are introduced by a call to repentance. And the sorrow that these guys are experiencing was brought on by themselves. And he's saying, you have the words of the former prophets. You're not paying attention to them. Now the former prophets are Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings. It's not uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so on. Jehovah God is saying to the Jews, all these fasts that you held to me all these years, they weren't to me. They were all for yourself. You were eating and drinking and, and then not drinking and not eating. This is all for you. It's not for me. You were doing this all for yourself. I didn't ask for it. I just want your obedience. They were sorrowful that they were experiencing the difficulty. They were lamenting what had happened to them, but they weren't doing anything to correct it for the most part. Some were, some were, but most of them weren't. Most of them were just, let's go through the motions and let's have this fast and let's pretend like we're really sorry to God for what we have done to him. You know, all sin is against God. Even if you sin against another person, all sin is against God. And it's his, it's his obedience, or our obedience to him that he wants. These people here, during that 70 plus years, were just expressing their woe is me. Oh, woe is me. This is all happening to me, and it's just terrible that these things had happened. Most of them didn't 
understand or weren't willing to admit that it was their sin that brought this on. Their sin that brought this on. God wants to forgive them, but they got to ask for it. Now the last verse here says, Should ye not hear the words which Jehovah cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity, and the cities thereof round about her and the south and the lowlands were inhabited? All Zechariah is saying, what God is saying through Zechariah is, pay attention to what I've already written in the Bible. These former prophets have told you what I want. I want your hearts. I want your obedience. Because these false fasts were just hypocritical. They had nothing to do with what God really wants. They were just being hypocritical and self-centered. And they just didn't want to bend their hearts towards God. You know, there's an image in Isaiah where God is describing that unwillingness to follow him, to do what he says as a burrow that's got a rope around its neck and somebody's trying to pull it and the burrow just pulls its neck back and fights even harder. And God is using that word picture to describe the Jew's relationship to him. Well, people are like that. They, we want what we want instead of what God wants. We even make up our own Bibles. Ah, it's crazy. It's crazy. You know, the prophet here does not come alongside the sinner and commiserate with him. Gee, I'm really sorry this happened. No, the prophet comes and says, hey, you're the cause. You're the cause. He's very plain. He's very, very plain, very precise, and very loud. But he's accurate. He's completely accurate. You know, you wouldn't have gotten in this spot in the first place had you followed God. Now, this is not a new message. God has been saying this since the creation, since the fall, I should say. The problem didn't exist before the fall. People have been persecuted, especially the Jews, throughout human history because they didn't obey and recognize God. Had they done that, their persecutions would have been gone. But they didn't do that. They didn't do that. And they were just, you know, just talking about this general region. The Negev is a desert area south of uh, Jerusalem, south of Judah. And the towns there were in constant danger of the Philistines and other marauders. So what he's saying is you, you were protected. You were protected. Why were you protected? Well, because at periodic times you would actually obey God. And God would lift his condemnation. He would protect you. And, and they just didn't get it, although some did. There are very, very few of them that will admit that the Nazi persecution and the Holocaust was because they won't accept the Messiah. Some will. Some have done that. Some have actually said that. Not very many. Not very many. They still want to do a woe is me. And it was terrible. There's no question about it. Hitler killed over six million Jews alone. It's a terrible thing. Had they confessed the name of that Messiah and believed in Christ, it never would have happened. It never would have happened. They now had a fledgling community that Jerusalem was expanding outside the walls. They were building houses. They had wholesome people running the temple and Zerubbabel running the city, trying to bring it back. And what God is saying here is, don't turn away from me or all this stuff's going to happen again. Don't turn away from me. I don't care about these practices. I care about your heart. Shall we pray? We hope you have been blessed by this message today on a contemporarily relevant Bible topic. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, an author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the Dean of the Jewish Studies School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. 
He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Hebrew College in Massachusetts. Please write us at Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Again, that's Post Office Box 48, Hart, Michigan, 49420. Or call us at 877-706-2479. That's 877-706-2479. Once again, 877-706-2479. Let us know if you have any questions about today's broadcast. We look forward to providing you with continuing Bible messages each week on this station. God bless you.